Hello. So uh, I was told, and it appears to be true, that this is an intimate space. <laughs> How lovely. Uh, uh, I was told, and it appears to be true, that this was a generous space. So I hope that what I'm about to do is an act of generosity is the same, in the same way that Tara came up with all those fantastic tips. I would have been taking notes if I'd brought my pen. Um, I'm not going to tell you very much about what I do because there's blogs and websites for all that. We've only got 12 minutes. And you all know, I expect, the quote that's attributed to Winston Churchill, I think, which is, I'm sorry I'm writing you a letter. I haven't got time to write you a postcard. It takes a lot more preparation to speak for a short time, so I have made some notes. I, also, I want to say that I do sometimes shave and put on a new shirt for things like this. <laughs> but it's my eldest son's uh, 16th birthday today. So I saw him above the Surrey Hills, you will know, Steve, about 2,000 feet in a glider. And uh, it was a very proud moment, so you can hear from the wobble in my voice, but it wasn't the proudest moment. Proudest moment was when he came back down and you book it for an hour or something, and he had another flight that he could do. And he, and he said the best moments were the taking off uh, and the coming back down. Uh, when he came back down, he didn't go for another flight. He turned around to his younger brother who was feeling a little bit left out, being brave, because he's 13, and he said, do you want to go? So Stanley went up, and they both flew at 2,000 feet, so I had a good time. I then got stuck on the M25, which is why I looked like shit. <laughs> 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 okay, so we've got slides which I was using just for notes, so I, I may abandon them at some point. Um, I came across a beautiful quote, and I promise you inadvertently, isn't it funny, the, the happiness of things about reach. And, and half of it is this, to reach is to risk. Uh, there is little grace in a life that never extends out beyond the boundaries of self. Little grace, after your slides, an amazing word to have. So we must reach, why must we reach? Why must we reach? You see, it really does make sense, I honestly have prepared. <coughs> So I think the cost of not reaching is too great. Uh, at best, it's boring. We remain the same. So why must we reach? Because the cost is too great. We will, we will at the best remain the same, untouched, unmoved, uninfluenced. And at worst, we will atrophy. Why would a communicating species like us not reach? And we've heard you mentioned uh, Robin Williams. I met a friend in Edinburgh who two years ago, I would have sworn in the next year, was really likely that he would commit suicide. And I saw him on Saturday in Edinburgh and he hadn't committed suicide. He was doing a play at the Travis. He got a fringe first and he was doing amazingly well. Another friend of mine, who I thought was full of the joy of life, committed suicide this year in Glasgow, not Edinburgh. And at some level, that beautiful man couldn't reach. So we must reach. We must. It's not a choice. Personally and professionally, I'm interested in understanding difference. That's what it says on my website, so it must be true. What kind of difference? Football teams, cakes, playlists, these are important to some of us, but they're not profound. They're likes and loyalties. So what are the kind of differences that, that exercise me, that get me out of bed in the morning? They're the deeper ones. What's the difference between you and I in terms of who you are? Female, Canadian. And it was only a rhetorical question. Imagine if I, <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. What's your name? Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you very, very much. <laughs> So we've only just begun. If we have more than 12 minutes, imagine. But, but I could imagine from over here, all the way over here, what Jennifer's perception of herself might be. It's probably wrong. Right? Who is Jennifer to Jennifer? If I don't know that, if I don't know what the gap is, how can I begin 
to cross it. I'm really interested in that difference. And the, the other difference that I find profound and important is not just who Jennifer is, but who Jennifer is in relation to the world. Is the world for Jennifer, uh, uh, is it a playground? Is it a place for exploration? Is it a place of fear in some cases? Where does ambition lie for you in relation to the world outside? These are the important gaps. These are the important differences. So I'm not really interested in what we have in common. I'm interested in what separates us. And the way that I do that, my, my tools are dialogue. My tools are conversation. I help people talk to each other for a living. That's what I do. So I wanted, in a generous way, to quickly give you three ways to reach people in terms of conversation. Is that OK? Is that OK? Yes. I can't talk about anything else. I haven't written it down. <laughs> so while I give you these three top tips, think about one of two people. Think about either someone who you struggle to communicate with. Maybe you work with them. Maybe you sleep with them. Maybe you live next door to them. Maybe you're applying for a loan to them. Right? Think about maybe that person. Or think about the person who you wouldn't even dream of trying to have a good conversation with because they're too different. They think too differently from you. Or they're, they're too old. Or they're too rich. Or they're too beautiful. All the reasons that we may not try and reach out to them. Have a person in mind and just see if any of these things hit home. For me, my teenage son might well be my older teenage son, because he's not an angel. He started smoking, smoking drugs. So we've got some big conversations to have, and I need to reach him somehow to have a conversation with him. So have someone in mind. Three quick things. How we describe things. We fall into three categories. We either we, we have a very strong visual way of communicating or an audio way of communicating or a kinesthetic way of communicating. We all know what visual or visual and audio are. Kinesthetic is what we touch, what we feel. Yes? How many of you are conscious when you sat down and thought, mm, this is a nice seat? Or this seat doesn't I don't like this seat. Just how many, just put your hands up, how many of you felt that? Right? You're the kinesthetic people, you're the people who respond to things. How many of you thought, I quite like the fact it's just a white word on a black background? Yet yeah, you're the visual people. And how many of you have noticed the sound of the projector? You're the audio people. So I'm very audio. We, most of us have one very strong one, a kind of second one that's about halfway down, and one that's on the floor. Usually the one on the floor is audio. We're the rare people. We're the best people. We're the special people. <laughs> the rest of you, good luck. <laughs> So when you think about describing something to somebody, think about their language, not yours. You may be, it wasn't a joke, it may be the person you sleep with. They may be very kinesthetic, you may be very, very visual. And when you're trying to describe something important to them, the reason they're not seeing what you're saying is because they're very kinesthetic or they're very audio. So how does an audio person say, I understand? What words do they use? Pardon? Uh, they might, they, uh, yes, they might. What else? They might say, oh, I hear exactly what you're saying. They might say, it rings a bell. They say, oh, okay, that really resonates with something I was hearing. They'll use resonant, they'll look at the verbs, look at the verbs. How does a visual person say, I understand? Yes, visual people say, I see. I see what you mean. How does a kinesthetic person say, I understand? I feel they might say, I feel what you're saying, <laughs> if they're from the 1970s. Or... <laughs> Yeah, and why not, Duncan? Um, they might not say anything. They might just go, <coughs> right? Or they might say, got it. Right? It's a tiny little clue. It sounds so simple it can't be true. We could talk longer about it and I won't. But it's a little clue. But the point is, to describe something well, you must abandon what we're used to, laziness. To describe something well to someone, to reach someone, with the things that you're saying. It could, might be a pitch, it might be trying to tell them about your journey or your holiday, it might be inviting them to a party. You have to change your natural preference. Consider that. How much time have I got, Steve? Fuck me, two minutes. <laughs> Excuse my French. Sorry, I get a bit industrial when I'm hot. Uh, listening. <laughs> Do you hear the small things? I worked with a detective, a guy called Dick Mullender, who could only be a copper, couldn't he? Worked at Scotland Yard, Dick Mullender. 
work with him on talking, he gets people down from bridges, talks people down from bridges. When you're learning how to do that, and I sat on his shoulder for a while, you have someone who listens for you. Imagine that in your life, someone who listens for you, who goes, Tara, Tara, she's mentioned her sister three times now. That must be important. Do you listen well in order to reach? And finally, do you ask good questions? Do you ask why seven times? Try it, it's great fun. <laughs> and if you feel it's a bit aggressive asking why, just use the magic word wonder. I wonder why, I wonder why that might be. It softens what you do and it allows you to ask deep penetrating questions to whoever you're working with. Might be a drug addict, might be a CEO, could be both. <laughs> These are skills, they are skills, and of course you can find them in my new book called Say It and Solve It, which is in my bag. But they are, they're more than skills, they are, the, they are the ways to reach, they are the method to connect, they are the practical actions to bring us closer. But there's something more important and there's something that is harder to describe and it's an old-fashioned word and it's dedication. You know when you dedicate yourself to somebody or when someone dedicates themselves to you, it is an extraordinary feeling, an extraordinary feeling. And I'll abandon my cards because I only have 30 seconds left. There's something about presence. Reaching feels like a, a, a strenuous activity, like a, like a muscular thing. And I know that sometimes, and I don't do it often, but I do it sometimes, when I do reach someone very different to me, it's sometimes not because of what I've done, it's something I haven't done. With my six-month-old son, yes, six months old, 50, six months old, I have to forget that I want him to talk before any other child his age. <laughs> I have to let that go. You know, like on the monkey bars, when you're trying to reach, there's that moment you think, I'm not going to reach that unless I let go of that. So maybe, maybe reaching is to risk. Maybe risking is to live. And maybe sometimes living is to let go. Thank you so much for your beautiful listening. Thank you.